Hi, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This show is about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. He's your host, Taylor Fossack. Hello. And he's the lead engineer at IT Pro TV. With him today is me, Jason Fry. I'm one of the engineers here at IT Pro as well. Thanks for me joining you today, Taylor. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, Jason, and for introducing yourself. Yeah, we think it's fun for the host not to introduce himself. So, uh, what are we talking about today? Well, I know that last week you were asking me a little about the languages that we use every day here at IT Pro and kind of why we chose them. Uh, for context, the languages that we use on the back end is mostly Haskell, and on the front end is mostly Elm. And there's a lot of choices, especially on the front end, of which language you want to use. And you were wondering, why do we use Elm? Yeah. Uh, I've heard you talk about PureScript, talk about it well, and I'm interested in learning more about PureScript. So I guess the question I asked you was, if we were to make this decision again today, knowing what we know and, and uh, experience we've gained over the last year and a half, what would that, how would the decision change? Would we use PureScript on the front and back end for simplicity's sake? Would we still use Haskell and Elm? Would we use Haskell and PureScript or just go back to JavaScript? <laughs> I'm pretty sure we wouldn't go back to JavaScript. Everybody seems to like working with Haskell and Elm around yes. here, so I don't want to subject them to the horrors of JavaScript. It's true. It's true. If we made the decision again today, I think we would end up with the same choices, Haskell on the back end and Elm on the front end. But I wasn't here when we made the decision in the first place, so I'm not entirely sure if, you know, we had to, if we were still using JavaScript and we had to reintroduce some new languages, would these ones gain traction or would we end up using something else like TypeScript on the front end and Go on the back end? I don't know. Obviously, I like Haskell, so I would really campaign for that one on the back end. But on the front end, I feel like there's not a good way to use Haskell on the front end, or at least not a way that I would want to subject everybody on the team to. I know that there are tools like GHCJS, which let you compile Haskell into JavaScript and use it on the front end, but they seem to be not quite production ready. Um, I feel I'm a little hesitant to say that because I know that people are using them for real and using them in production, but uh, I am not ready to make that leap. So what what is not quite there for GHCJS in your opinion? Because um, I know very little about it, but I thought it's been around for a little while, and it theoretically should be usable. But but you're like, no, we we won't do that. So what is what is lacking in your opinion? Yeah, before I get into what's lacking, I just want to do a brief recap or summary of what GHCJS is. Yeah, as the name implies, it is like GHC, except it emits JavaScript rather than static binaries or, or binaries. And that's a nice thing because you can use the exact same code on the back end and the front end, and it'll work in both places. Yeah. One of the project goals for GHCJS is to be able to compile all of Hackage, the Haskell package repository, and have it just work on JavaScript. That's in comparison to things like Haste, which are a subset of Haskell that you have to specifically target. So it is kind of like Haskell and you can reuse a lot of the same stuff, but not everything. So I mentioned that because that's kind of the upshot of GHCJS. And if that sounds interesting to anybody listening to this, then I encourage you to go check it out. But for me, one of the reasons that I'm not excited about using GHCJS in production is that um, well, it comes down to do th two things for me. One is that it produces very large build artifacts. So the amount of JavaScript that it produces is very high. And the reason for that is that it has to emulate the entire GHC runtime system in JavaScript. All of the laziness, all of the multi-threaded abilities that GHC has, it has to pretend to be able to do those things or actually do those things in JavaScript, which doesn't support them by default. So that means that a really small application, the classic example of just something that prints hello world, ends up being very large in GHCJS versus if you wrote it in plain JavaScript, it's literally one line of code. Okay, that makes sense. Um, my understanding though is that Elm produces some a lot of lines of code in JavaScript. So when you're comparing these, is it just a lot more with GHCJS than with Elm, even though Elm is kind of a lot itself? It is. I wish I had some specific numbers to point to, but my 
kind of gut level understanding is that GHCJS will produce JavaScript on the order of like one to 10 megabytes. Whereas Elm, I think typically is under one megabyte pretty comfortably. Yeah. Wow. That is a lot. Okay. <laughs> and I, I, the number in my head for Elm is for like a small app, you're talking about kilobytes. You know? Yeah. So that is a pretty big difference. Okay. That makes sense. And to touch on that for a second, one of the reasons that Elm produces a somewhat large JavaScript bundle is that it has its own runtime to handle all the message passing, passing and serializing to and from JSON and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But it tries really hard to match the semantics of JavaScript whenever possible. So it's strict and it's single threaded. So it doesn't have to deal with multi-threading or laziness or anything like that. So its runtime can be a lot smaller. So a little more about GHCJS. Is, is there anything else that's sort of lacking there or is that just sort of, that's basically it? That's the main one for me, but kind of riding on the coattails of that is that performance can be a problem with GHCJS. The GHC runtime, the one that you get by default just compiling a normal Haskell program, has been tuned pretty well over the years. Haskell is a surprisingly old language and GHC is a surprisingly mature compiler. And the stuff that you produce out of it will perform really well. You don't have to worry like, oh, this is not gonna, this tight loop is not gonna perform well. You can, if you're interested in it, really optimize the performance of stuff, but that's a discussion for another time. With GHCJS, it is largely the work of one person and it seems to me, I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems to be a more of a hobby type project for that person. It's not the thing they're working on full time. So they don't have as many opportunities to get these optimizations in there to make the program that it produces really, really fast. However, even if they did have the time to do that, it still has the problem of basically running the Haskell runtime inside of JavaScript. So you've got a price to pay just for doing that. So that performance makes me kind of shy away from it. Again, I wish I had some specific numbers for how you know Elm performs versus GHCJS versus vanilla JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And it's also my understanding that GHCJS has improved quite a bit recently and gotten a lot faster, but I think it's still slower than all of its contemporaries. Okay, so let's compare those two then. Um, if the comparison is no longer with Haskell, like we're just always using Haskell on the back end, then on the front end, PureScript versus Elm, pros, cons. We went with Elm. We really like Elm, but I do sometimes wonder, because I'm just curious about PureScript, if we were going to make the decision differently a year and a half ago, but um, you, know, you answered that. What would we do to today? We'd probably still use Haskell and Elm. So let's just compare them. You know, the PureScript's pretty great. You talk highly of it. Sure. I really like using PureScript. I used it um, kind of recreationally for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've never used PureScript in production, but I know plenty of people who have. So I have confidence in it in that regard. Uh, backing up a bit, you mentioned that it was around a year and a half ago that we started using Elm. And... It was kind of the entryway for us into Haskell. Before that, the team was largely using JavaScript with a smattering of other languages like maybe Go or Rust, something to that effect, right? Yeah, I don't think we were using Rust. We weren't that cool back then. But yeah, Angular one point something or other and Go. And I feel like we have a TypeScript file in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Elm is nice because it is very simple, especially in comparison to Haskell. And because of that simplicity, it has the ability to produce very helpful and illuminating error messages. When you do something wrong in Haskell, not you specifically, but anybody on the team, <laughs> often the error message that it spits out is inscrutable. Yes. And I have frequently seen team members completely stumped by an error message and call me over and I have to say, well, what it's really telling you is this and here's how you may want to fix it. Versus when something goes wrong in Elm, that's almost literally what the Elm compiler tells you. It says, hey, I saw you did this. I was expecting this. Here's how you might fix it. And that's super useful when so many other things are changing because Elm forces you into this weird architecture, weird from the perspective of an Angular developer. It's completely foreign. And it's a strange syntax and it's a different compiler. All of these things changed. It's really nice to have that helpful compiler there at your side. Absolutely. It's one of the things we really like. And with Elm 19, it's an even friendlier compiler. Took me out to dinner last night. Just <laughs> complete gentleman. 
But uh, for when we started Elm you know, a year and a half ago, it was really helpful to get those that sort of helpful feedback. But we still were pretty new, and even with it being a, a friendly compiler, we still were stumped uh, much more often. But now we have some more people in our company that are coming in and learning Elm. Um, more of our design team is starting to learn Elm. And that highlights it even more for us is that they have repeatedly said, oh my goodness, this compiler is so helpful. So that is really cool to to hear them say that and for us to be reminded because we begin to take it for granted. Um, and especially because we compare it to the Haskell compiler, which just today had some issue that I thought when we compiled it was going to complain because a parens was in the wrong spot and it gave some really gnarly output. I was like, I don't know what you were saying. Put a parens <laughs> there. My kind of gut just tells me that's what it is. Sure enough, that's what it was. Yeah. But if I had not already suspected I was going to have a parens issue, I don't know how long I would have looked at that output, <laughs> not knowing what to do. Yeah. I often find that the GHC compiler is more useful at telling me that there is an error rather than what exactly the error is. Yes. Usually I'm like, well, I probably know what it is already. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for letting me know, Haskell. Yeah, so we love Elm's compiler. PureScript's compiler just isn't quite as friendly. It sort of has a couple tattoos Not and <laughs> smokes or something. Not nearly as friendly. In fact, when you compare Elm to Haskell and you see how much better Elm is, I feel that when you compare Haskell to PureScript, you see how much better Haskell is. Mm. So <laughs> <laughs> that bad, huh? Yeah. Granted, my perspective of the PureScript compiler is woefully out of date. I used it maybe two or three years ago, and I am confident that in the meantime, things have gotten better. But it feels a lot like it technically tells you what the problem is, but it drowns you in a bunch of context and weird variable names and other things and weird terms. From my point of view, I wouldn't be super comfortable throwing a junior developer in front of the PureScript compiler and having confidence that they could figure things out. Or not a junior developer, but our front-end team. If they were working on a PureScript application, I would expect to be called over there frequently having to you know, puzzle out some output from the PureScript compiler. Right. So... One of the draws of JavaScript on the front end and back end is the simplicity. Elm is not yet usable on the back end, I don't believe. Haskell, as we've discussed for us, we're not going to use it on the front end. So is there still value, though, in going with PureScript because you can use it on the front end and the back end? Maybe not for us because we can do Haskell and we think Haskell, as good as PureScript is, Haskell's even better. But if Haskell wasn't an option for us for some reason... You know, does that make more sense to go PureScript front and back or Elm front end, PureScript back end or, or something different? Given the choice and having to exclude Haskell, I probably would choose PureScript on the back end. I may end up choosing something even more niche. Actually, I don't know that it would be more niche, but something like OCaml or ReasonML all of which can compile to JavaScript. So for instance, if I had a mandate that said, you have to run Node.js on the back end, I would say, okay, I'll do PureScript. I would say, why? Well, why do I have this mandate? <laughs> Who's making these mandates? Um, in those situations, I would choose something like PureScript or OCaml or ReasonML over uh, GHCJS. Yeah, There's or... plenty of languages that compile to JavaScript. I think that PureScript uh, in a lot of ways is better than Haskell. It addresses a lot of the problems with Haskell that come from it being a very old language that has sort of ossified around these strange original design decisions. For instance, not having anonymous records. So every time you want to build a new data type, you have to explicitly say, these are all the names of the fields and their types. Versus in PureScript, you can just create one as easily as you create a tuple or a list or whatever. Nice. Similarly, strings in Haskell are notoriously a linked list of characters, which is one of the worst representations you could come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I could come up with the worst one, but, but sure. Whereas in PureScript, they're basically the same as JavaScript strings, which given how ubiquitous JavaScript is, we have to assume are at least somewhat acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so PureScript does the anonymous records, which reduces a lot of boilerplate. So if you have a user record with a name and an age and an occupation and, you know, blood type or whatever, uh, sure. Uh, and you want a subset of that record. 
for some other purpose. So you have like your master record and then you have, well, here I just want these three fields, but there I want these five fields. That's what you're talking about with anonymous records? Exactly. Okay. As an example from our code base, we have the fully fledged user type that has those fields you're talking about, not blood type. We don't yeah. capture that about our users. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we also have a minimal user, which is useful when we're writing tests or when we want to add a new user and we don't have all of their information yet. And we don't care. Like we don't have their address or their billing information or any or of that. their shirt size. Their shirt size, exactly. With Haskell, we have to explicitly make a user, a minimal user, a slightly more minimal user, a slightly less minimal user, a user with a bunch of other fields tacked on. Um, and in PureScript, you can make all of those a little more implicitly, a little more off the cuff. And as we frequently experience, one of the hardest things in day-to-day -day software engineering is naming things. Oh, yes. And Gosh. when you have to make new explicit types for everything, you have to make names for them. And this sounds kind of like a petty concern, but it's honestly hard to do. Because if you have a user and you have a user with two different fields, they're both users. So, but which one, you have to call one user and one something else. It's, it's frustrating. User prime, user <laughs> prime prime. Please don't do that. User prime prime prime. <laughs> we don't allow primes here, right? No primes. No primes. Uh, yeah, so I like that. I can certainly hear someone who prefers the Haskell way of doing it though, because arguably those are different things and different things should have different names. Very true. But in the day-to-day, -day, it is just kind of inconvenient. So mm -hmm. are, is there anything else that comes to mind, you know, PureScript being better maybe than Haskell in some way or some other benefits to it? I think that it has a lot of well thought out type level features. This isn't something we typically work with in our work at IT Pro, we try to stay in the value level as much as possible. But Haskell is moving in this direction where it's getting closer and closer to having dependent types, where your type signatures and your type computations can depend on the values themselves. And the classic example of this is a list where you know how many elements are in that list. And so you could prove, for instance, with a map operation that you don't change the number of elements. This I don't really don't want to get into dependent types, but suffice to say that I think PureScript has a has a lot more niceties in the type system that to get them done in Haskell, you have to turn on a bunch of language extensions and jump through some weird hoops and do some things that aren't very comfortable. So to bring it back home, I think your original question was, if we weren't using Haskell on the back end, what would we be using on the back end? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. So... Ultimately, I think I would choose PureScript. The, the reasons that I prefer Haskell over PureScript right now are that it produces executables, binary executables, which are a lot easier to deploy. Mm -hmm. In our instance, we stuff the executable into an empty Docker container, throw it up on AWS and run it. With PureScript, we have to stuff all of our code in the container along with all of its NPM dependencies and all its Bower dependencies and Node.js and then throw that up on AWS and run it. It's a much bigger container. There's a lot more points of failure and lots of security, well, things that could go wrong in mm -hmm. there. Not to say that nothing could go wrong with the Haskell thing, but it's conceptually simpler to deal with. Also, Haskell has multi-threading built in. So if I want to say, send this email off on a separate thread, I can do that and it's built right in. Versus doing that in JavaScript or PureScript, you have to handle that with asynchronous and, sorry, asynchrony and callbacks. So you have to say, well, do this, but while that thing is executing, nothing else can actually happen. So if you have some CPU intensive stuff that you want to do on a separate thread, you can't. You have to rely on a much more heavyweight abstraction like a queue. So you publish work to the queue and then have something else, some entirely separate process, pull it off the queue and do that work. So those kind of operational concerns are what make me lean toward Haskell versus PureScript right now. Okay, that, that multi-threading constraint sounds pretty significant um, because a lot of what a backend is going to do at some point, maybe not a lot of what it does, but frequently you're going to be doing something like that where you're wanting to handle something asynchronously, send off an email. Yeah, almost all the time. Yeah, <laughs> always send in emails. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, PureScript sounds great. But if you can do, if you can use Haskell, it sounds like you should. It. You should. Uh, of course, that's our opinion because that's <laughs> literally what we're doing. Uh, but I, I, I start to see that a little bit better now. Thank you. So we're choosing Haskell on the back end. 
over PureScript because Haskell just has more tooling like a uh, asynchronicity, whereas PureScript is a little more complicated. It's easier to deploy because Haskell just has the binary that you deploy that, mm -hmm. um, whereas PureScript, a lot more points of failure there. Again, these things are tend to be solved problems, but there's always cracks in that. Yeah. So uh, just nicer, simpler to think about, simpler to handle. Um, so that's Haskell versus PureScript on the back end, just quickly. On and the, to jump in for just a second, I would love to use Elm on the back end, but it's not currently an option. And mm -hmm. I feel like Elm is doing very well at targeting the front end and its particular niche that it wants to dominate. And I want to, you know, I'm very happy that they're doing that. If I could use it on the back end, I would love to, uh, but. Oh, really? <laughs> That's the first I've heard of this. <laughs> Elm on the back end, Haskell on the front end. <laughs> you heard, heard it here, here. first. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So Elm over PureScript, primarily because of the compiler. Mm -hmm. PureScript has a lot more complexity, a lot more robustness in some areas, but you don't need those strictly. They're really quite helpful in some cases. So maybe your use case, you really do need those things. But for most people, most of the time, Elm totally targets single page apps. They are focused on that and they're doing it quite well. The compiler makes it really easy to pick up this new paradigm of functional programming, a new syntax, it has, we didn't talk about this, but something that we like a lot here at IT Pro is it has this architecture built right into the language itself. And it's nice to not have to think about that or worry about that. It's just there. Right. The tooling's really good. It's opinionated formatter, so you don't have formatting wars or arguments. So those are the, some of the reasons that you mentioned and that I just threw on top of that, <laughs> of Elm over PureScript. Um, it's like PureScript, seems really good, but Haskell might just be a little better than it in a lot of cases on the back end, and Elm just might be a little better than it in a lot of cases on the front end. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I, I just need to use it recreational like you used <laughs> to, is what I need to do. Thanks for being on the show with me today, Jason. Thank you. It was great to have you here talking about Haskell versus Elm versus PureScript, a fight for the ages. Versus a bunch of other things. Well, we don't talk about them too much. <laughs> And thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This has been episode three. If you liked our show, find out more at our website, haskellweekly.news. Thanks again for listening. I've been your host, Taylor Fossack, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.